Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. We are talking about reframing the interactive process to achieve effective communication. My name is Kate Lewandowski, and I am the Accessibility Resource Coordinator here at NDC, and I'm a member of the HELP team. At NDC, we provide guidance and resources to help colleges, universities, and other educational programs prior to NDC. I worked at a large public university as an access consultant for deaf students and was the services coordinator in services to students with disabilities. My pronouns are she, her. As a visual description, I am a white woman with shoulder length, dark blonde hair. I'm wearing a black shirt and have a dark background behind me. Welcome, let's get started. Now, for those of us who work in post-secondary disability services, the interactive process serves as the foundation of our access and equity work. It allows us to navigate the barriers that students face and implement accommodations, which then culminates in an equitable experience for the students that we work with, or at least that's our goal. But we have noticed that the majority of students who seek accommodations through the Disability Services Office has become rote. For most students, they have to follow a lot of steps. They have to submit a request for accommodations. That initial meeting has to take place, and then they have to jump through all of those hoops in order to receive the necessary accommodations. Now, this approach may serve the general population of students with disabilities, but it's not likely to address all of the nuanced needs of deaf students. And we want students to have an equitable experience on campus. Institutions have an obligation to provide effective communication access to all parts of campus life, including in and outside the classroom. We encourage colleges and universities to use an interactive and student-centered approach. So today we're going to dive into how student services professionals can do that work with an equity lens with deaf students. Next slide. So the concept of the interactive process is rooted in the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. These laws require post-secondary institutions to engage in an interactive process with students to identify and implement reasonable accommodations that ensure equal access to education. You know about AHEAD, the Association of Higher Education and Disability. They drafted guidance which states that ensuring effective access requires a deliberate and collaborative process that centers the experience of the individual. Additionally, accommodations need to be monitored and adjusted throughout the student's experience on campus. Because accommodation policies and practices must be flexible enough to adapt to the individual as circumstances could change during a student's enrollment in the program. In 2009, the ADA or the um, Amendments Act of the ADA broadened disability definitions, which prompted AHEAD to recommend modifying processes. And they use a term called intentionally fluid. They want to be flexible enough to meet the changing needs that students have. Next slide. So let's take a moment to examine some of the common practices in post-secondary disability services using that equity lens and the impact it could have on the interactive process. For example, when students apply for disability services office support, they're often asked prior to an initial meeting to submit some type of third-party medical documentation, which outlines the severity, frequency, and impact of their disability on their daily life. By requiring that medical documentation up front, and relying extensively on documentation to, quote, verify a student's disability, this suggests that the student's self-report of their own disability and how it is that they use accommodations carries less weight. 
This perpetuates a medical model on disability rather than the social or cultural approach. Also with deaf students, a medical documentation like an audiogram does not give you the full picture of the barriers deaf students face in class. Two students can have the same exact hearing loss, but their approach, language preferences, communication abilities, both receptive and expressive in the class will be very different. We also see that disability services professionals or what we call DS professionals, they'll decide on what accommodations are reasonable. And they take that power away from the student to make that final decision on the accommodation. We want to reinforce power dynamics that shift the power to the student to be in full control of their journey through school. We know that students can be prevented from feeling as though they can advocate or even request for changes in their accommodations. Finally, it is common practice for accommodations to be provided only after eligibility has been determined. By waiting until an eligibility process has been completed, this can significantly impact the deaf student's capacity and the office's capacity in coordinating accommodations for deaf students, such as hiring qualified service providers or collaborating with your campus tech support to set up remote services. When there isn't enough time or space to adequately plan for effective accommodations, it results in an access experience that is reactive instead of proactive. Next slide. So this is a typical deaf student's experience and a challenge that they face when they navigate access in higher ed, especially when working with disability services offices. And we're going to see Felicia's story to reflect the challenges students encounter in higher ed. And the interpreter will be reading the captions. Every time I went to the disability office, my experience was always negative. I would go in feeling awkward that I quote, needed help. I struggled with that feeling. The person at the front desk wasn't friendly. When I used sign language, they showed obvious disdain towards me. I hadn't even asked for a pen or paper yet. Now my experience was varied when I made requests for accommodations. I've never been asked what I prefer, but rather been given assigned accommodations. Now as a teacher, I have a student who needs services. I become familiar with them and I advocate for their needs. Often it goes back to someone who has the privilege. For instance, a sighted person is often making all the decisions for a deaf-blind person. The student should be expressing what's best for them rather than me or some other sighted person making that decision for them. As a sighted person, I hold myself responsible to do the same thing with my students. That has helped me understand what accommodations mean, who they are for, who they are serving. My students need access, and that's important. I have some tips for those of you who work with students who request accommodations. Recognize your privilege. For example, I mentioned there is a deafblind person. I am not going to take on the role of making all of their decisions. I recognize my privilege and I need to allow them to be autonomous. When addressing your curriculum, keep in mind universal design. The overarching goal is for that curriculum to be accessible to everyone. What I suggest is that you engage in introspection, self-analysis, attend workshops, but don't stop there. Continue to learn, grow, and unpack. Educate yourself. Engage in open dialogue with others. Don't wait for someone else to tell you how to do something. Research, explore, and discover resources on your own. Another suggestion I have is to evaluate yourself. As someone with privilege, ask yourself, how can I serve and support my community as well as myself as a person? How does my privilege hurt others, even if it's unintentional? It's important to recognize and act in ways that build others up. 
Many of Felicia's tips and strategies are critical in reframing the interactive process. And we will discuss this more in detail soon. Let's move on to the next slide. Unfortunately, Felicia is not alone in her sentiments regarding the interaction with DSS offices. Many of the student data that we have collected show an overall feeling of frustration regarding relationships with DSS and overall campus access. Here on the slide are some student quotes that we have collected from our most recent survey, the DPAIS or Deaf Student Post-Secondary Access and Inclusion Scale. Students want to see campuses hold professors accountable for not providing approved accommodations. They also want campuses to recognize that auto captions do not provide equal access. Deaf students with disabilities experience more challenges with requesting or receiving accommodations. The disability resource offices need to be aware and trained on working with deaf students because they often lack empathy and understanding of the experiences of deaf students. These stories are important. We continue to collect feedback from students regarding their campus experiences. This information helps us share strategies with you. So please see our DPAIS website if you would like more information on how to share this um, measure with your own students on your campuses. Let's move on to the next slide. Again, we've seen those comments from the deaf students in the previous couple of slides. The relationship with the DSS office plays an integral role. From the very first contact with the Disability Service Office, the interactive process sets that tone for campus access, equity, and inclusion. And that process should also align with your institution's overall responsibility to ensure deaf students have effective communication both in and out of the classroom. Let's move on to the next slide. So by now you've noticed I've mentioned effective communication several times. So what does effective communication mean? Well, defined by the US Department of Justice or the DOJ, they have a document on effective communication and it establishes the standards for effective communication. Entities that follow Titles 2 and 3 under the ADA are legally responsible to ensure that effective communication services are provided. Now, that means it is equally effective as what is provided to their hearing peers, and that means both receiving and expressing information. Effective communication is critical for deaf students to access the college experience. And it can only be determined by going through the interactive process. Next slide. So it is time to do away with business as usual and instead reframe the interactive process with deaf students in mind. Effective communication starts with a person-centered approach that is collaborative and follows an iterative accommodations model. So in the next few slides, I'll break down the key aspects of a person-centered, collaborative, and iterative approach to this interactive process. Let's move to the next slide. So the first step to reframing the interactive process is to an adopt an individualized, person-centered approach. Accommodations will depend on many factors, we know deaf students are not one size fits all. Deaf students will have different communication approaches, educational experiences. They may have gone to a school for the deaf. They may be mainstream. We also see that deaf students' identities and access needs may change throughout their post-secondary experiences. For example, many students are not aware of the potential accommodations they could request in college simply because they were not exposed to those options in high school. Maybe they didn't need a particular accommodation because the school or the class size didn't warrant it. Content, context, and communication approach matters. 
deaf students needs may be different depending on their goals, the environment, the situation, et cetera. In my experience as a former access consultant, it was typical for some students to request speech to text services for lectures where a professor was just presenting, often speaking as fast as they could so that they could see the key terms that were being used in class. But for interactive discussions, students would request sign language interpreters so that they could engage in conversation with their peers. Finally, a critical component of ensuring effective communication access is to defer to that student's subjective experience. Again, students are the experts in what they need. Often we receive questions from disability services professionals such as, you know, this student is requesting interpreters, but can we provide speech to text instead? Well, in this type of situation, we often encourage professionals to consider why it is that the student is requesting interpreters and to explore how interpreters address the barriers students face before other accommodations are considered in lieu of whatever the student has requested. Sometimes students instinctively know what they need or want for accommodations, but find it challenging to express those needs explicitly, especially to a hearing person who does not have the extensive experience with accommodations for deaf students. This often comes up with interpreter requests. A deaf student may share that they need an interpreter who's more, quote, ASL aligned or more sign English. And some disability services professionals just don't have the experience or knowledge to understand the nuances and the context behind these requests. For that reason, if disability services professionals are not sure of what questions to ask or if they're unfamiliar with the accommodations to offer the student, it would be a powerful indicator to seek out additional training or mentoring from someone who has this expertise. Next slide. Building a positive rapport with students starts with collaboration and shared decision-making. When students feel connected and supported, they are more likely to succeed and to continue the interactive process with the Disability Services Office. To build positive relationships, this involves first, clear communication. Keep the communication with students transparent and straightforward. As a disability resource professional, I know firsthand how difficult it can be to navigate student requests while also maintaining obligations from the administration. To share information about administrative decisions can sometimes feel like involving the student to be privy to these behind the scenes operations. However, by being transparent with students about the why behind policies or practices, this can help students understand decisions. For example, you may need to communicate to students that you need requests for speech to text uh, services by this specific date because it is much more difficult to secure accurate speech to text service providers as most providers will have made their scheduling commitments with other schools by then. Secondly is attentive engagement. Pay attention to the experiences that students have had and learn from those experiences. Exploring with the student what works and why can help clarify what accommodations are needed in different environments. Third is honest conversations. Create a safe space for questions and discussions. Some campuses will implement a policy on how many no-shows, uh, or how many student absences from a class without canceling the service provider in advance are allotted. And that way students can have this before services may be suspended. As we reframe equitable practices, I would strongly encourage disability service professionals to consider a person-centered approach and invite the student in for a genuine conversation about how the student is doing prior to moving to other more punitive options. See what type of change can happen. By connecting with the student first, this allows a disability service professional and the student to explore together how services are going 
and whether there needs to be a change in how accommodations are provided. Fourth is the acknowledge of power dynamics. Evaluate and explore opportunities for critical self-reflection and opportunities for additional learning on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide. The interactive process is not confined to initial interactions. It's an ongoing journey. As your students' needs evolve throughout their enrollment, the process needs to adapt accordingly. Ongoing interaction ensures that accommodations adapt to changing environments, regular check-ins, data collection, and doing adjustments based on evidence ensure that accommodations remain aligned with the students' evolving needs. By adopting strategies such as being flexible, exploring options, and trial and error, this helps guard against biases and fosters more informed decisions. Next slide. All right, so let's discuss the scenario and how we can reframe the interactive process with a new accommodation request. Suppose you have a deaf undergraduate student that is taking organic chemistry, a notoriously difficult class on campus. For this class, they requested sign language interpreters. Your office hired an interpreter team who interpreted the class before. Three weeks after the start of the semester, the student sends you an email with a request for speech to text services in addition to the already requested interpreting services. And your office does not typically provide dual accommodations. What do we do from here? Let's move on to the next slide. Now let's consider the student's request for dual accommodations with a sign language interpreter and speech to text simultaneously for their organic chemistry class. When we think about this request using a person-centered approach, a few things stand out. By this time, we would have had an initial meeting with the student and likely a few interactions before this request came through. We would know the reason why they're taking their class. This class is because their goal is to attend medical school and ultimately become a physician. This means that the organic chemistry class is one of those make or break classes for the student. So after inviting the student to class, we learn more about the barriers they're facing. The professor speaks very fast. It's difficult for the student to take notes while also watching the interpreter. And the student is struggling to catch all of the new terminology that's shared during the class lecture. Now shifting to collaborative decision-making, the student needs interpreters to access class concepts. But speech to text services would provide access to key terms. This would be the time to explore what type of speech to text services uh, would be beneficial for the student. You can figure out which option works best for CART, CPrint, or TypeWell, and then make a plan to trial that accommodation. Also, since concepts are important to the student, but they have a hard time taking notes, this information could be helpful to share with the interpreter team so they can explore directly with the student if the interpreters need to adjust their approach during class, since the student expressed issues with taking notes. Speech to text service is not a form of note taking. So then how can the student be able to take notes while also having access to the content? So your office plans to recruit a peer note taker for the student? Finally, this would be a good time to take the opportunity to explore universal design strategies that then the professor could implement in class. For example, maybe the professor could share their notes or could they increase the use of visual clues during class? When accommodations are implemented, the interactive process does not stop. By adopting interactive accommodations model, disability services professionals should continue the interaction with the student get by gathering feedback, doing continued consultations with service providers, and doing follow-up with the faculty. 
To wrap up this presentation, we encourage you to consider how you can reframe your interactive process with deaf students. An equitable student-centered interactive process looks like listening, learning, and building rapport with students. An invitation to dialogue, transparent conversations, doing routine feedback collection, and assessing your own biases and privilege. Next slide. If you're interested in learning more about the interactive process, we recommend exploring the following resources. Here at NDC, the National Deaf Center, we offer facilitated classes by cohorts. Our course on advanced practices, uh, evaluating and managing services using data goes deeper into actionable strategies, which you can use when working with deaf students. Please contact us to be put on the invitation list for the facilitated course. Another resource is AHEAD. AHEAD has two guiding documents specifically for post-secondary disability service professionals in working with students.